Welcome to the Dragon Ball Access Podcast with Smugstick and Dragon Ball University. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Ball Access Podcast. I'm Josh from Dragon Ball University. And I'm Luis from Smugstick. And today we will be talking about Dragon Ball video games. Yay, I love video games, especially (laughs) ones that are Dragon Ball. We're going to talk about early Dragon Ball games that we played, what we want to see in future Dragon Ball games, and just also whatever fits the video game Dragon Ball category today. Yes, very much looking forward to it. I know for me personally, I started off with some Japanese imports of early games uh, for the PS1, Ultimate Battle 22, Final Bout, and I believe it ended up being called Dragon Ball Z Legends, which is now just confusing thanks to the (laughs) fun new mobile game that is uh, almost the same name. Um, So I played those with a weird converter pack that I had to plug into the back of my PS1, then put in an American PlayStation game, get it to run the boot sequence, and then take the disc out and put in the Japanese Dragon Ball game to get it to continue from there. It was a lot of fun, and I can't do it anymore, and it makes me sad very often because I really, really liked Legends a lot. (laughs) <laughs> that's really awesome and I'm kind of jealous that you got to experience that because I wasn't really around as a person when the PS1 era games were really the mainstay I really spe- I was really into the PS2 era especially with Budokai 3 that was really my first Dragon Ball video game maybe even my first Dragon Ball experience overall wow yeah, for the, anybody wondering, Luis and I have a bit of an age gap between us, which honestly I think is kind of fantastic for having Dragon Ball discussions because it's almost like we belong to two different generations of the same fandom. So over time, I'm really looking forward to figuring out things that I was into that you didn't never had the chance to be and vice versa. So I, I don't know. I think that's going to be pretty nice. For me, my first uh, U.S. game that I played was Budokai 1 for the PlayStation 2. That came out when I was a freshman in high school, I believe. Oh, wow. Budokai was most of high school for me. Budokai 3 came out, like, right out the summer that I graduated. So high school was pretty much Budokai for me. (laughs) I I liked it, though. That was the first game I had ever played. Uh, Oddly enough, as weird as one of the big draws for Budokai for me was mid-game Super Saiyan transformations. Like, I hadn't had any game where you could do that before. You either selected Super Saiyan or you didn't. That was that was the coolest thing about Budokai 3 to me, especially going all the way to Super Saiyan 4, because when we got uh, Tenkaichi 1, you couldn't do that anymore, and it was really upsetting. Yeah, that was one of the biggest drawbacks for the first Tenkaichi for me, was having like to have gone from an evolution of a trilogy that allowed you to eventually do all sorts of different transformations, and the, the key and the aura in that, in, in that game, the, it just looked fantastic. That was one of my favorite things, was what it looked like powering up as a Super Saiyan was very, very accurate to the original series. I mean, at least slightly updated to, to match the graphic style of uh, the game on PS2, but it was... It really hurt to go back to like, oh, I have to pick Super Saiyan Goku again. Now, <laughs> I think I, if not two, I think three definitely solved that. I, I'm yeah, honestly, it's been so long since I've played Tenkaichi three that I don't remember if it had mid game transformations, but I'm pretty sure it did. <laughs> and yeah, like no, some pretty it, major ones. Yeah, it was starting with uh, Tenkaichi two where they got back into the thing where you could transform in game. Yeah. Oh, that yes, because they because by the time I maybe in two, but definitely in three, like you even had like you could do, uh, ultra. I mean, however you want to consider it, ultra Super Saiyan Trunks or Super Saiyan Grade Two, but you could get beefy Trunks from regular Trunks just transforming, and that was a lot of fun. I really liked the team battle aspect of that too. That was a really fun game for making what if scenarios before they had uh, a character creation. Yeah, man, it was crazy, and I remember YouTube around the time uh, those games were around, because you also had the the playback recorder, and people would use that to create uh, little fan fictions on YouTube and episodes, and that was the coolest thing. I started, I actually started doing that right around the Ultimate Tenkaichi era. Once we had the custom custom characters available, that really, that's kind of what started my channel, actually, was... Not that I ever got around to making the what-if scenarios that I was trying to do, but I would create new characters. For example, one of them, one of the first characters that I made, he was a Saiyan, but trained by Krillin. And I had this (laughs) whole story about how it was, how Krillin was so excited because he felt like the Master Roshi and this kid was his Goku and it was an opportunity to create somebody even stronger than him. And 
Then I wrote a whole series with, and that character, while he didn't make it in, a version of him did. And then, uh, yeah, a lot more stuff happened. And I tried to build an audience to make that series. And then building my audience turned into what Dragon Ball University is today. So that's I'll get back to it. Awesome. That's a really neat backstory. <laughs> It's it's really largely how it started. It was in oh, it was six six years ago this month actually. It was August of two thousand twelve that I made a couple of phone calls to some guys people might know now as Jared and Archie and said, Hey, I'm gonna start a Dragon Ball YouTube channel and I'd like you to join me. And here we are. Six six years later we've evolved from we started off as the Blue Banner Brigade, which was kind of a play on the Red Ribbon Army, and then we turned it into just the Blue Banner, and then we turned it into Dragon Ball University. And that was a whole thing. I was trying to come up with a new name. I'm like, I just want to teach people about the Dragon Ball universe. And then I said that sentence out loud. And then Dragon Ball University clicked in my head. And the channel has been that ever since. (laughs) I guess it's really appropriate that we're talking about video games as our first episode then. Yeah, that's really kind of what started everything for me was was Dragon Ball video games. Although (laughs) I realize now I've kind of split off. So back to to video games. What, What else? What did you play after Budokai 3? What was your big... After so what Budok- was the next really big one for you? After Budokai 3, well, Tenkaichi 3 was the biggest one. I prob- That was probably the one game I spent more hours in than any other one uh, with my brother. But after that, uh, Infinite World all the time. I still wish I could play it. That was probably my favorite uh, Dragon Ball game of the era. I'd like to see a re- an HD remaster of that. Like, Give us Budokai again, but give us the HD remaster 2, which has Budokai 2 that we never got the first time. And then Infinite World. I want to play some board game story mode and have beam struggles and have Infinite World just because. <laughs> yeah. I like, really, oh, I loved that game. It would be so cool. Like, all just seeing the HD version of Goku running around Snake Way or collecting the Dragon Balls or the Time Chamber training, that would be incredible. I uh, th- That game took a lot of, I mean... I, I guess you can't really say risk, but it really it tried to do something new with Dragon Ball games, especially in its story mode, and that really, really drew me in. I, I loved doing the, the the gravity chamber training, and I believe hyperbolic time chamber as well. I think you did Vegeta and Trunks in the gravity room and Gohan and Goku in the time chamber. I might just be making this up, though, because it's been a really long time. I uh, actually lost my save file for Infinite World on a trip to North Carolina. I was going down to visit a friend about 10 years ago, and on my trip, somehow my PlayStation 2 memory card fell out of my bag on the plane, and I got to his place in Jacksonville and realized I didn't have it. And I had been, for weeks, I had been like, dude, this new Dragon Ball game, you got to play it. He had left to join the military, so he really wasn't doing a lot of new new gaming at the time. So I, I told him, you really got to try this game. I hyped it up for like two months, and then I got there, and we never even played it because I lost my entire save file. That's going to be the saddest story I've ever heard. It made me really sad. I, I just just talking about it now, my mood has dropped at least a little bit, <laughs> and now I want to play it again. W- going to the next gen, at least what was the next gen back then, like the Wii era, they had yes. Tenkaichi three. But I think to me, the most important things of that era was probably like Revenge of King Piccolo and Origins Ooh. two, and all those weird games that came. Side scroller. I really, yeah, Revenge of King Piccolo was a lot of fun. Um, Just, I mean, there weren't a lot of Dragon Ball games, and there was that, and I honestly can't remember the name of it, but there was also a Dragon Ball side-scroller for the Game Boy Advance that was really, really fun. Advanced Adventure. Yes, oh, thank you. So, yes, didn't it had the the Tenkaichi Budokai stage, and you could do (laughs) verses, and oh, it was so much fun. I liked that game. I had that on a Game Boy Micro, oddly enough. I oh, bought it on wow. a Black Friday sale. That thing was like a keychain, and that's all I had for it. All I had was was Advanced Adventure. <laughs> and honestly, to give credit where it's due, because, I mean, surprise, surprise, based on what I put on my channel, I'm not a huge fan of Dragon Ball GT. I do appreciate it for certain reasons. I like the design of Super Saiyan 4. I think the art style in mostly the whole show is fantastic. A lot of the animation was beautiful. But there was a Dragon Ball GT like side scroller beat 'em up for the Game Boy Advance as well that ended up being a lot of fun and of course I don't remember the name of that either. Yay. I'm, doing, I'm I'm two for two on not remembering Game Boy Advance <laughs> games so far. That one was a uh, GT Transformation. 
Yes. I, I see. I'm, I'm glad you know all of these things that I don't remember. <laughs> Here, here's one I do remember that might be, honestly, one of my favorite Dragon Ball games of all time, not just Game Boy Advance, but Dragon Ball Z Boost Fury is, to this day, one of one of my personal favorite Dragon Ball games and close to everything that I wanted in a game, at least at the time that it came out. Absolutely. That game was probably my introduction to the English score. Okay. Uh, and I loved it. I love it so much. I finished it uh, during one summer. That's all I would play. We went to the beach. I brought my uh, uh, my Game Boy emulator, and that's all I played. Honestly, it, for in terms of like the the English dub lore and everything, you really couldn't get a better game than Booze Fury. I mean, it used it used the Falconer score for starters, which in that particular sense worked really well. He did a lot of like synth music and a lot like the thing that I think I dislike more most more than anything about the Falconer score was that it never ever stopped. Like nostalgically I like it because that's what I heard in high school. Everything was all about that music when I watched it on Cartoon Network five days a week. But I never until I got until I started watching it later on in life and watching it with the Japanese score, but with the English dub, only then did I realize that the music stopped a lot at very appropriate times. And then I went back and tried to watch it with Falconer, and no matter what they're doing, they're standing around, and it's just din, 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 <laughs> din, 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 like all the time. It never, ever, ever let up. It was just, let's have music playing every second of every scene. But for a video game, that really actually worked in its favor. That's a I, really way to put it. I've never thought about it that way because I've never really been a fan of the Falconer score. But thinking about it as video game music, yeah, you're right. I think it works really well. It did a really good job for it. And they they stuck to the English dub script in that game a lot. Like, a lot of that game is word for word what you would see in the Funimation dub. So if you like the Funimation dub at all, it's a really good game. But honestly, it's, it's, a, it's just a good game, period. It's one of the only games I've ever seen that applied um, training weights in a way that just really, really worked. Like you could put weights on your character starting off small and going all the way up to, I don't even know what the measurements were, but they got heavier and heavier and actually physically slowed your character down as a result, but exponentially increased your experience. So it was literally like training with weights. You'd put all these on, you'd be really slow, but you'd gain much more power from that than, than if you had not. Mm -hmm. And And Legacy of Goku 2 did a really good job as well, but... Boost Fury just it, it fixed everything that was wrong with two. Yeah, for sure, and I think it's also a really good representation of that uh, storyline. I think it does a really good job just show, showcasing that. Yeah, it even tried to tie movies in too, and in some ways, I thought that was really silly because I mean, if anybody who's ever come to Dragon Ball <laughs> University before should know that I'm all about those movies not fitting into the timeline very well, but. One in particular was they tried to squeeze Fusion Reborn into the canon story of Dragon Ball in a way that actually worked. And to this day, I, I still think it's it was a great example of how to get Janemba into it while still making it work. Because one of the biggest things is Janemba would have occurred while Majin Buu was ravaging the Earth. Like, there's no way that those two things can can count. But what they did was they cut out all of the Earth side of that movie. And it really worked. Like, you just got a chapter after Vegeta blew himself up fighting Boo. You then take control of Goku. And right after you teach the boys fusion and how to go Super Saiyan 3, and Goku's time runs up and he has to go back to Otherworld, he shows up at King Yama's. And King Yama's like, hey, uh, hell's frozen over with jelly beans and stuff. And you got to go and situate (laughs) it. And then you go and you find Vegeta and you fuse into Gogeta and you fight Janemba. And it really worked in a way that it just could, that the movie itself couldn't, couldn't have pulled off. Yeah, and it was really refreshing, too, because, you know, uh, there's a lot going on throughout the Boo saga, so it was nice to have a break to do something else, and especially since fusions were such a big part of that game and such a fun part of the game. I thought it was really appropriate. Absolutely. Ooh, speaking of fusion, have you gotten to play Dragon Ball Fusions? Oh, for yes. For the 3DS. Oh, oh, oh. Another, another absolutely fantastic one. Mm-hmm. Pro- it's probably it the changed best up game the RPG in the style. generation. It's, I I mean, one of these days I'm going to have to make a list rank of what I actually think are the absolute best games and see where it places. I I just hope they make another one for Switch at some point. Me too. Well, really for all consoles, but but oh, that game was just so much fun and it, it changed up. It, it was like how they somehow mixed 
an RPG fighting element with like billiards and it worked <laughs> in just such a really fun way. And I mean, just seeing all these different combinations of fusions and your character could fuse with like anyone. Oh, I, I was, that was a fun one. Now I, now I want to play some, some fusions again. Yeah. This, that's too. all this is going to do. This entire conversation is going to lead to me just playing more games. <laughs> like, hey, Josh, we should get episode two going. Like, I'm sorry. All that talk. Now I'm playing fusions and attack of the Saiyans at the same time. <laughs> no, man. And f- uh, the thing about fusions is that, um, like a lot of Dragon Ball games, um, well, specific Dragon Ball games. It had a lot of love and put into it, and I feel specifically like the locations were c- created in such an awesome way that they look just like the show. And like there was like a little quiz game that you could play, and they were actually like tough questions about the show. A and, lot of them were, yeah, really tough. Yeah, and you could collect little portals that showcase different parts of the series, from Dragon Ball to GT and the movies. The hub world to me, it was it was almost kind of reminiscent of Xenoverse in a way, but a little bit different. And and I liked that too. They didn't try to just straight up copy it, but a lot of time anomalies and like, oh, Kame House is just floating around here so that you can see it and visit it. And... Yeah. Uh, speaking of Xenoverse, we should talk about how freaking insane the hype was around it, because it was it was a big deal. It, it meant a completely rebirth of the Dragon Ball franchise as far as video games go. And on it, it really has. Like, if it, for, for as much as people want to compare and contrast Xenoverse and Fighters, we wouldn't have Fighters if it weren't for Xenoverse. It just wouldn't have happened. That, that resurrected the Dragon Ball game in a way that I just... I mean, I'm still... To, I, I still play Dragon Ball Xenoverse at least once a week. Well, Xenoverse 2 at this point, but... <laughs> It's then, not quite yet everything I've wanted in a game, but what it does have is the mechanics to get us there. It uses a lot of a lot of mechanics that I think if you apply it into something new, like the the lock-on system in Xenoverse is incredible. It it, it kind of stepped up the Raging Blast and Tenkaichi era into something new. It gave you that three-dimensional fighting, but in a way that you can now pick multiple characters and have group fights at the same time. Like even Tenkaichi three had five on five fights, but it was tag team. So to be able to just to you're fighting Jason Birder at the same time. And if you're good enough at the game, you can send one of them flying and then change your cursor over to the next character and continue your combat with them. Yeah. It, so as much as people like, don't want to admit it, it does take some skill to play Xenoverse too. And uh, oh yeah. in a good way. And I think it, 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 like, one of the things I really liked in Raging Blast 2 was the uh, the signature skills that could be used with either Circle or B, depending on what console you were playing on. Because it gave every character their own unique feel that really made them feel like themselves. And, and like, Gotenks was one of them that was perfect because his would change up into different. He'd do his spindle top punch and his dynamite kick. And uh, Wait, yeah. dynamite kick was Mr. Satan, wasn't it? Nuclear kick, that was... If if you're if you're watching dub nuclear kick was a was a go tanks move, I messed that one up. <laughs> but it uh, Xenoverse the the ability to swap out all these different commands so that you could have all of your specials and attacks controlled by hitting the bumpers and and triggers instead of having to enter complex combos. It really lets you do a lot of stuff on the fly. That's that's really fun. I. I one of the things that I used to love doing when I'd play three-player matches in Xenoverse is I would have instant transmission equipped to a character so that if one of my teammates got knocked down, all I had to do was lock onto them and teleport right down, get them back on their feet, and teleport back up. That's... But it's, it really allows you to chain stuff together in a, in a fun way. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. Like, I loved using the feed Kamehameha because it could... Not the feed Kamehameha, the, um, the Kamehameha that pushes you. You don't know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yes. Yes. I don't know the name of it, but I, I remember it. What yeah. Is it? That, we'll figure it out. So It's so useful, and I love using it. It, it co- combos really well into so many things. Uh, just thinking about this makes me makes me get a rush of adrenaline. We might have to hop on some Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2 for the Nintendo Switch at some point soon. And yeah. <laughs> see, see, see what we got. <laughs> Now, I mean, on that too, uh, Fighters was mentioned very briefly, but uh, I mean, it's as the newest game in the franchise, it's definitely worth talking about. Um, 
fighters really kind of reminded me of Budokai 3 in a lot of ways. Not not really in any of its control schemes, but just in the fact that it was a, a good Dragon Ball game, but a great fighting game. And I don't feel like we've had that in a while. Even Xenoverse, you can't really... You can't really call Xenoverse a great fighting game. It's kind of very uneven in terms of, uh, of of fights. There's not a lot of balance with most of the characters, which I think, again, serves at, serves it as a Dragon Ball game, but not so much as a fighting game. Yeah. And One I... of the things I like most about fighters is Krillin being able to fight Beerus it's, and having it make sense within the story. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And uh, I, re- I was really hyped up for fighters, and I love the game. But, you know, I haven't been playing much of it because I feel like it likes a bit of content but the way it's been supported and the way the the people making it have really made each character feel unique to one another is really incredible and an achievement since a lot of the characters in Dragon Ball whether we like to admit it or not use very similar techniques a bunch of beam attacks and things like that they're not necessarily the free the free different god i can't speak uh set each other apart too much Mm -hmm. but they've made these things really you know useful in different ways yeah absolutely and it's it's it does like you said it made every character feel unique in a way that normally they're not and it's nice to have some balance i mean how awesome is it that a lot people kick so much ass with yamcha now like i never (laughs) thought those words would be able to come out of my mouth yet here like yamcha is one of the best characters in this game and that's just it's it's awesome to see some of the the lower levels get their their just desserts. It's it's nice to it's really it's nice to see Krill and Tian and Yamcha be useful for lack of a better term. And I <laughs> I, I regret honestly that I even just said that because I love Krillin. He's I Krill I, I can we could do a whole podcast talking about Krillin one of these times. We should. I okay. I'm I'm down. Episode three, Krillin and why he's awesome. We'll see. What happens. <laughs> but it'll it'll be it'll be it's it's happening. It's gonna happen. I just I think with fighters, one one thing that people I don't know if it's that they don't want to see it, don't want to admit to it, because there really seems to be fighters is so different than Xenoverse that it's become this kind of war of its own. Like it's 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 become this thing of what's better, Xenoverse or fighters, and they're both better and they're both worse it just depends on how you want to categorize it and look at it like in my opinion fighters is a way better fighting game than dragon ball xenoverse but dragon ball xenoverse is a way better dragon ball game than dragon ball fighters that was a lot of things to say yeah i have to agree for the most part with that um the thing that really sets fighters apart is the community it's built it's been built around you know with the whole competitive competitive scene we just finished evo not too long ago and that was a huge deal it 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 was the most watched thing on twitch at the time and for a dragon ball game let alone an anime game to do that is so awesome (laughs) It, it really is like it's i mean the game's been out for months at this point so the fact that it's still got traction is a really good thing the fact that it has entered a competitive scene like that like i never ever would have thought that you could like a Dragon Ball Z game is is actually being treated with some of the same level of respect as Tekken and Street Fighter and Smash like no no way and it is it's got its own really nice competitive scene it's just but that's what it is for me is it's it's locked into being a great fighting game that looks like Dragon Ball and has absolutely gorgeous visuals but for me one of the biggest things that I love in Dragon Ball is immersion. I want to be a part of that world. That's why at 31 years of age, I'm still talking about it and, and doing all this. I I want to be immersed in it, and that's what Xenoverse personally does for me. I mean, you want immersion here. Make your own character, pick your race, and fight alongside Goku. You don't really get much more immersive into the Dragon Ball universe than that. Whereas with fighters... I find I spend so much time not enjoying what I'm doing because I'm busy going, oh, well, this team of three characters either wouldn't work together or it's impossible for them to work together. And I spend most of my time thinking about that. Like, I I can't have teen Gohan and adult Gohan on the same team. That doesn't make any sense. (laughs) And it's that honestly is one of the only things that really takes me away. I do kind of wish that they would add other modes like a one on one option. I mean, I love I'm a big fan of Marvel vs. Capcom. Two and three are are great games, and and Marvel vs. Capcom three is one of the only fighting games that I actually feel like I'm pretty decent at. Far from great, I couldn't play in any kind of competitive scene. But if it's getting a bunch of friends together in a room, I'm probably gonna beat you in Marvel vs. Capcom. <laughs> and I love fighters because it reminds me so much of that. But 
as a Dragon Ball game, it just doesn't do it for me. It, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous game that I spend way too much time overthinking. Yeah, yeah, I have to agree with that. The thing about Xenoverse versus Fighters is that the story mode with Xenoverse, I feel it's... I don't know if it's more daring, but it does more with this story than Fighters did. You, did you play the far, Fighters story mode, right? Uh, not through no <laughs> well I'm, um, I'm, i at this point i've had it for so long that i'm just waiting for the switch release and i'll i'll play the story mode on the bus and stuff and uh, so yeah i i really want it on the switch just having dragon ball on the go in a different way was really fun no i never got around to the story and someday i'm gonna have to really break down what happened because uh, oddly enough this whole thing ties back into the launch of dragon ball university and the um, creating characters and whatnot through Ultimate Tenkaichi, that became a big reason why myself and someone else on my team, we kind of despised fight. Like, for for a point, Archie from, from Dragon Ball University, obviously big fan. He's one of three members that founded this channel with me. He didn't play Fighters for the first time until about two months ago, simply because of the new character, Android 21. Um... The one of the biggest parts of the original story that we had been working on when we launched our channel involved revolved around a villain character we made called Android 21. Now, one of the silliest parts, like, of course, it was the next number in a sequence. If they ever made a new Android, it was going to be 21. So we shouldn't have gotten so hung up on that. But it was just really hard to see a character that we knew we had come up with to an extent and granted they went in a completely different direction, which is awesome. And we've since re reworked everything, but it, it really, when they announced that character, both of us, we, we probably shed a couple of tears or something. We were very upset. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Uh, it's pretty heartbreaking. I'm sure a lot of fan fiction writers had the same problem since 21 oh, yeah. is probably like, the most And that's the number. thing. There's no way. We are far from the only people to have ever come up with an Android 21. Like, that was going to be a thing that happened. But it, it was just, it was sad. But it, honestly, uh, it was good because it's, it's since it's made us rework the idea. And honestly, I think we have a better version. When we're finally ready to release this original story we've been working on, I think we have a much better version of our Android 21 that we had come up with originally. So mm -hmm. ultimately, it was for the best. It, it gave us a much more original take on the character. <laughs> With that, I, I think now that we're caught up to pretty much the present, I would like to talk about what we want in Dragon Ball games. Absolutely. Well, You want to go first or me? I got plenty. You, you go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll go ahead. For me, um, I, I prefer the RPGs. Uh, Attack of the Saiyans, Fusions. Those are really the ones like... Oh, Buse Fury, Boost Fury. Uh, a new Dragon Ball RPG would probably be my top on the list. Especially if it was a sequel to Attack of the Saiyans, that would be amazing. Absolutely. At this point, I think it's been so long, we might need a remake. But that, I, I would take a sequel. I'll hopefully. take it. I mean, Attack of the Saiyans was just, I mean, a, a three-player turn-based RPG. Like, that's that's something that I really think Xenoverse hit home with, is the realization that just because Dragon Ball has a lot of fighting doesn't the show is not about fighting. The The show is more about growth than anything. And you can really nail that in an RPG. So when, when Xenoverse combined and made an RPG with a fighting element to it, or vice versa, however you want to look at it, it really kind of... It's a major step in the right direction, I guess, is, is where... I Xenoverse started to do things that I had always wanted to see in a Dragon Ball game back in the era of the Tenkaichi's Raging Blast Ultimate Tenkaichi. But the the lock-on ability is something majorly that I really wanted to see with that. What I want is something honestly similar to Xenoverse, but give us a more open world concept. Don't not just locking us into the the arenas that we have, which I mean the portals and stuff was a really cool way of being able to go from one area to another, especially in parallel quests. But give us an open world where freezes on Namek somewhere and you know whether your your character could either have a scouter or over time you put stat points from leveling up into your key sensing ability and then that allows you to no longer need a scouter and you can sense what direction your enemies are in 
But what I want to see is an open world similar to, to like Budokai 3's flying around, but with a much bigger scale and let you fly until you find Frieza and then lock onto him and then fight him. Like that, as soon as you lock onto a character, then it goes to your Xenoverse fighting style or what have you. Yeah, I agree. That would be awesome. An open world type of thing would be so cool. And honestly, uh, you you mentioned the portals and parallel quests. I think I uh, I didn't like that, especially if you were like in West City and you took a portal just to go inside of Capsule Corp. That completely yeah. broke my immersion. And it really, I I guess it's less that I liked the portals and more that I accepted it. It was like, okay, they're at least giving me a way to get from Kami's Lookout down to, to Earth and down to Capsule Corp. But no, we need something completely different. Yeah. And I, it- I want to be able to have an enemy be like, all right, see ya, and take off. Like, I, that would be like, what if you could do the solar flare and then fly 30 miles away and your your opponent doesn't have a scouter or the ability to sense key? Fight's over. Like, you, you win if you want to consider it that way. That would be so cool. Do do a Krillin and just get away from Dodoria? Exactly. Just flash and buy. <laughs> I, I, th- I mean, and, and I want to see something like that. But really, the an open world is... That's, that's more than anything. That's what I need to see is an open world. Mm-hmm. I don't know fully how to handle it from there. Because that, that raises the question then, too. Would, would you personally, would you rather have an open... If you got an open world Dragon Ball game... Would you be comfortable with going back to a static Dragon Ball story? Like, all right, we're going to give you the open world, but you're going to play as Goku, Krillin, Piccolo, Yamcha. And like, it's almost like a 3D open world Boo's Fury. So uh, you're, you're, it, would you trade the ability to create your own character for the ability to travel throughout this, this Dragon Ball world? That's what I was thinking, too. I don't know. I feel like the character creator has become such a mainstay for these past few games, yeah, at least in this style of game, that it it would be hard to get used to. And I feel like people wouldn't accept it. I feel like yeah. people would riot over that. And I mean, this is mostly a hypothetical question. I don't think that one would necessarily negate the other. It's not like we'd have to have it that way. I could personally see, if it was an open world and a multiplayer game, that could really make things a little more difficult. So maybe even just a couple different modes, like you have an open world kind of a almost like an MMO, like you have an open world where you're playing with other custom characters. And honestly, you could even continue to tie it into the Xenoverse story. Like Xenoverse 3 could do this if it wanted to. It could open its world up and become something different and still fall into the same style where you're time patrollers and all that. But un- like another one that I'd, I'd like to see, even like let's say for Xenoverse 3, you open up the world completely, but you're maybe tied to a single player mode if you want to follow the actual Dragon Ball Z story of it. That, like, that one would thing be I awesome. think would be great is programming those characters to do what they already did. Like, okay, here you go. Like we've we you're a time patroller, we've sent you to Earth and Cell is trying to absorb the androids. Go stop him. And like you have to sense him while he's suppressing his key. There's so many fun things that could really be done with just taking the boundaries away from Xenoverse. That's a really cool idea. Like and you could go like up to Kami's lookout, and you and you just see um, like Goku and Gohan waiting for Vegeta to get out of the chamber. That would be exactly so cool. like have the whole thing take have these levels take place in real time for the Dragon Ball world. <laughs> that that would be a dream. We're, we got to make it happen. Whoever's li- if somebody listen to this with money and resources, and give us a call. At School of Z, at Smugstick on Twitter, find one of us and be like, hey, we want to make your, your game dreams come true. <laughs> uh, now that, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to talk about the story again. Uh, which, w- I think we're, since we've been getting so many new new Dragon Ball stories that don't necessarily have to be set in the, in j- not going through Saiyan and Frieza, Cell, Boo, you know, getting completely original stories, do you think it that's necessary, or do you think we could go back to just having the Z story over and over? Honestly, I'm maybe not over and over, but I would not be complaining if they went back to the Z story for a game in the future, mainly because we've had a break from that for a while. I mean, a lot of the games kind of started to break out of it. Like, Raging Blast 2 had a lot of what-if scenarios again, which was really kind of cool. I mean, having Super Saiyan 3, Broly, and Vegeta 
Uh, that was something really cool that tried to shake things up a little bit. So I think we kind of got the start of it with Raging Blast. Then by the time we went to custom characters, it was like, all right, like all is fair now. Once once you opened up the ability to create a new character that never existed in that story, that alone was a refreshing break for me. And then fighters had a while. I Again, I didn't play all the way through the story, but I, I know enough about what happened. Like they had a new original story with a new character. So I feel like we've gotten that the break that we wanted. And I'm I'm personally ready to go back to it just as long as I know I'm not stuck there forever. Yeah, no, I have to agree with you. My my personal hope is that Xenoverse would just expand itself a little bit more. Don't go into four. We we never get a fourth installment. We never got Budokai four. We never got Tenkaichi four. We shouldn't get Xenoverse four either. Like round it out with a nice trilogy, and li- listen to people. That's one of the big things. Is is clearly Bandai Namco has been listening. I mean, Xenoverse two is still getting support, new downloadable content, new free updates, eight months into the life of Dragon Ball Fighters. I mean, this game is almost two years old. That is insane that it's still getting the level of support it's getting. So I really feel like people are being listened to. Now do what you did with Xenoverse 1 and take every feature you added, roll it over into 2, and then do this again from 2 to 3. We shouldn't lose anything going from 2 to 3, but we could still. there are still ways that they could expand and... And make three more like this, more of an open world concept, more something that people want to see. Now, one thing I I do have to admit is Xenoverse, for me, did find a way to make the restrictions actually work in its favor. And I don't know if Xenoverse did it or if I did this as a way of coping with it or something like that. I used to hate the out of bounds areas in stages, like especially in a Dragon Ball game, when you get to the edge of that stage and it there's nothing beyond it you can't fly past it here you are this is the end of it i have to admit that in xenoverse for the first time i found a way to like rationalize how that would work and now what i see is i'm like i'm not in the dragon ball z wasteland i'm in a time bubble anomaly of the dragon ball z wasteland and the edge outside of the edge of the stage doesn't exist and that's kind of how I've like it, it makes every fight make sense in Xenoverse. And I know I just spent time complaining about how I couldn't immerse myself in fighters for the same reason. But in Xenoverse, it kind of does work. You exist in Toki Toki or Kanton City in this time hub, this space between time in Dragon Ball. And it's almost like you're just plucking versions of these characters out of their respective time and making them fight one another. So for me, it actually makes that work like it works that Super Saiyan 4 Goku is fighting Super Saiyan Blue Goku because you're literally plucking them out of their times, alternate universes, what have you, and putting them into an arena and letting them have it out. That's a really cool way to rationalize it. I've never thought about it that way, but uh, it makes me appreciate it a bit more. I, that's, I'm, I hope that it can help a few people, that they can cope with it and listen to <laughs> like, oh, I hate the outside of this stage. Oh, but wait. I'm, I'm hoping if that's if I can make people hate Xenoverse a little less then I feel like I accomplished something today. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to ask you what what's your favorite Dragon Ball game? Oh, hmm. Uh, honestly, I I really do think I have to give it to Xenoverse 2. Oh, wow. Really? I, I don't I don't think it's without flaws, but in terms of immersing myself into the Dragon Ball universe, I've never had an experience quite like I have with Xenoverse. The first time in Xenoverse 1 that my custom character was standing on Namek with Vegeta, Krillin, and Gohan, and first form Frieza was standing up at the top of the cliff, I felt like I was there. I was afraid. I'd been seeing this character since I was a kid, and for the first time, he could come get me now. And it, it, made, it, just, it made me feel like a kid at 28 years old at the time. So honestly, I I really think I got to give it to Xenoverse. If I had a longer, longer time to think about it, maybe I could change my mind. But in terms of immersion, Xenoverse 2 all the way for me. Yeah, yeah, as far as immersion goes, I have to probably agree with that Xenoverse. It's it's something else. It's really an experience, especially for a Dragon Ball fan to, to be able to be in the show with Goku and Vegeta and everybody else. Exactly. And it's crazy. They, the to feel that they, sense they of feel. relief when Goku arrives. Like, he's here! Yay! We're gonna be okay. Yeah. It's... it's No other game has given me that. I think... 
I don't know why what my favorite would be. There's a too there's too many games that meant so much to me. Uh, but Attack of the Saiyans is for sure up there. Uh, Tenkaichi Three, as much as people hate on it nowadays, it's definitely up there just because of the sheer amount of hours if, I've spent on it. If they overhauled the graphics and re-released that game, I would be all over it. <laughs> me too, for sure. Um, I don't know. My I don't know what my favorite Dragon Ball is. I I seriously cannot choose when I'm actually thinking about it. We might have to revisit this subject in another episode and have come up with it by that point. Yeah, probably. Also, apologies in advance for any dislikes I get us by Xenoverse 2 being my favorite. I've been around a long time with Dragon Ball, and I've played a lot. That just happens to be what really did it for me. Now, that said, I do I do like some Dragon Ball games that are universally panned, and I still like... I don't hate Dragon Ball Z sagas. I don't like it. I, I don't like it, but I don't hate it either. And again, too, it was like you were saying when you were playing Budokai 3 with your brother, a lot of that can influence it. Like, that's what it was for me. Dragon Ball Z sagas was the first co-op Dragon Ball game that my little brother, who was not nearly as into Dragon Ball as I was, would still sit down and play with me. And the whole time we'd be like, this is wonky and these controls suck, but we were playing together. So that earns bonus points for me. It really. I don't like Legacy of Goku 1. I did uh, until 2 came out. And I'll never go back. No, Legacy of Goku 1 is a really bad game. But I, I oh. that Dragon Ball Saga thing, I completely agree with you. Me and my brother spent also hours in that. And I was just talking to him about it the other day. And I was like, you remember Dragon Ball Saga? Yeah, that was a bad game. And I was like, but we had so much fun in it. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Exactly. Like, it was a horrible game. But that didn't make it any less fun to play with your brother. One of my yeah. favorite <laughs> things to do was lock onto an enemy and charge my Kamehameha and just teleport around them like 30,000 <laughs> yes. times. Like, ha, where am I coming from? Where am I coming from? And then I'd release it. One that of my least so favorite things about it that I'll admit, do you remember that you couldn't fly up or down? Oh, my like God. Like, if you wanted to fly up, you had to find the highest point you could climb to and then fly off of that. Oh, like, trying to get capsules that way was hell. <laughs> yeah. You're like, okay, it's about... 15 feet in the air by my estimation so now i have to find a rock on the other side of the level and then fly off of that and hope that i'm at the proper height to to get it another thing about that being said <laughs> give me sagas too i'll play it mm. uh but another thing about that i would too but another thing about that game is that you couldn't choose the same character like there was different versions of the characters also gohan with no arm from the future was the coolest thing and it's the only game that's ever given us it's that it's crazy it's one of the worst Dragon Ball games made, and it gives us a character that other games he should really be in. Um, like, let's see, Dragon Ball Xenoverse 2, uh, Raging Blast 1 and 2 maybe, but definitely 2, uh, Tenkaichi 3. Like, in, in, in Tenkaichi 3 and in Xenoverse, he doesn't even use that arm. <laughs> like, they, they made a one-armed character, they just gave him both arms. Yeah. They, that that still pisses me off to this day. I don't remember how you unlocked it, because I don't think you could... I don't think there was a s level with them, but I remember you could get them. And because Super yeah. Saiyans were incredibly strong in that game. Incredibly strong, but incredibly stupid to get them there. Yeah. Like, raise your key, and then raise your key again, and then keep raising your key until you either transform or your enemy punches you in the mouth and you have to start all of it over. Yeah, and Piccolo... Piccolo had a, a transformation too, uh, the fuse with Kami transformation. That's right. But it was the they same gave him thing. that a lot in old games. Yeah, he he powered up the exact same way for it. Yeah, but the thing with I think Broly, Gohan was Super Saiyan and then could turn two. Yeah, was another one of those. Like, what's up with that trend too? Like, there's a lot of Super Saiyan teen Gohans and no bases. Yeah, it was really weird. But and he's not even teen; he's 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Why did video games have to call him Teen Gohan and confuse uh, everyone? It's awful. But uh, it is with Broly uh, and with my brother. Just since you couldn't choose the same character, and there was only one version of Broly, there was this trick that my brother and I would do where we would both highlight Broly and we would count to three, and at three we both press Broly at the same time, and we and that's the only way you could select the Broly at the same time, and we demolished everybody on that game with that. It was great. Really? You you did actually get to play two players as Broly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I, I'm not going to lie. This is even making me want to play Sagas again. I'm going right. to go on a Dragon Ball game bender. <laughs>
Now, you got a chance to play Dragon Ball Origins, right? For the Nintendo DS? Origins and Origins 2, yes. Have you not played Oh, them? good. I No, no, I have. I, I very much enjoyed them. I was a big fan of Zelda The Phantom Hourglass, and this felt just like that, but Dragon Ball. Mm-hmm. So I, I, it was... I never, ever would have thought they could have such intuitive controls from a touchscreen and stylus. I can't believe how fluid everything felt being able to attack with the power pole and spin it around your head. And honestly, I don't remember it as much in Origins 2, but I remember when I first learned the Kamehameha in Origins 1, that was such a cool way to fire off a Kamehameha. Actually tapping the ka, me, ha, me, and the longer you held it, the more you got to charge it. So cool. Just oh, so awesome. awesome. The, that game was full of little details. Like, if you close the DS, Goku would say bye-bye. Or that, that's like that. right. That was, like, the little, the off sound for it. You what? That, I, I remember, yeah, he would, he, it was, like, it was, it was his signal that, that you turned off the system, in a sense, or put it to sleep. Yeah. And if you open it and up. And that just says, reminded hey, me of a Phantom Hourglass thing, too. We're, we're, we don't need to talk about Zelda on a Dragon Ball episode. Oh, shutting the DS is, is giving me just nightmares. <laughs> PTS PTDSSD. It was not not fun. Oh, but yes, I, I liked Origins very much. Um that was I was fortunate to when Origins came out was one of the rare times in my young adult life that I had a job I was able to kind of just sit around and do nothing and nobody really yelled at me for it. It was like an uh, I had to be ready for things to hit the fan, but as long as they didn't, I could kind of do whatever I wanted. So, yeah, I played a lot of Origins and Origins 2 during that time. That's awesome. I re- yeah, I, that was that was a very fun game. I actually I had it for the second time around not too long ago and then uh I actually got rid of my DS last summer, um, right after I got married, actually. My my wife and I both bought a Switch when we got back from our honeymoon. Aww. And, uh, yeah, so we, we got rid of a lot of our old stuff because yeah, it was dropping a lot on, on two back-to-back systems. It didn't last long. We brought home one Switch, and within about three days of me playing the Switch a lot and not wanting to give it up a lot, we decided eh, we're just going to go get another Switch. <laughs> and now we each have switches. Uh, Dragon Ball Origins. Uh, you've played both. You played both. You said right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Origins Two was uh, my first. That with Dragon Ball Origins Two was the first game I got for the DS, and I didn't know anything about Origins One. I knew it existed, obviously, because there was a two in the title. But uh, I eventually went back and got Origins One. But it's it feels very archaic compared to Origins Two, which I think is probably yeah. one of my favorite games. It, well, and especially, too, if for you to go backwards, like, I went from I only get to play as Goku to I get to play as five different characters. I can imagine doing that in reverse is nowhere near as fun. Yeah. <laughs> I I think that happens a lot with me in Dragon Ball games for some reason. I went from three, from Budokai 3 to Budokai 2, from Tenkaichi 3 to Tenkaichi 1, and stuff like that. It's really weird now that I think about it. Lots of, lots of out-of-order stuff. <laughs> maybe may, maybe it would make you appreciate the sequel more. Maybe I should start doing that. I should have, yeah, well, should have started with Xenoverse 2 and, and gone back and seen differences in features. And some, I mean, sometimes it doesn't take much to be better. Like, I remember one of the first things I noticed when, every, when Xenoverse 2 started getting its gameplay trailers and everybody was, like, complaining that it wasn't different enough from Xenoverse 1. One of the first things I noticed was, yeah, but rocks blow up when your key blasts hit them now. Like, and that was a big enough deal for me. I'm like, that's I, I'm on board. Man, what sold me on Xenoverse Two was that one trailer where the the trailer ended, but then you just you just see a flash of your character going Super Saiyan Three, and I was sold. Mm-hmm. That, that that oh my goodness, and they've expanded so much more since then. But it really that was a big deal. Like. You could only go Super Saiyan 1 and 2 in the first Xenoverse, and there was no difference with 2. 2 gave you some lightning, and that's all it really was. And honestly, one of my biggest complaints still with Xenoverse 1 is that your hair doesn't change when you go Super Saiyan. Like, even uh, Ultimate Tenkaichi kind of had that down. Not every character did, but some characters, if you went Super Saiyan, their hairstyle changed. Yeah. And, like, you could have flat Android 17 hair and go Super Saiyan and nothing's going to happen. Like, you're going to have gold flat Android 17 hair. But And that was a big reason that Super Saiyan 3 became a big deal because it was different. It was at least a way your character actually transformed. They didn't just change their hair color. 
Exactly. One thing I do, I had a complaint about in Xenoverse 1 was you ha you having to buy Super Saiyan. It just felt so wrong. But in Oh, Xenoverse that's right. 2, you had you had to buy the capsule, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in Xenoverse 2, you unlocked it. Like, you went Super Saiyan. Yeah, it was really cool. And it, it makes it feel... It, it's... I mean, that adds to the immersion. Like, your character has to work towards becoming a Super Saiyan. Exactly. And that's one thing that the added free content and stuff has really done right. Like, you can go Super Saiyan Blue in Xenoverse 2 now. And, oh, it's just so nice. And it looks really cool. The transformation's nice. And it honestly, it treats your character similar to what Xenoverse 1 did um, with Super Saiyan. How Xenoverse 1, you, you had like an unlimited pool of key. Well, it doesn't give you an unlimited pool of key. But in Xenoverse 1, when you went Super Saiyan, you could fire off as many ultimates as you could until you ran out of key and then your character would power down. Now you can maintain Super Saiyan forever. And the higher level of Super Saiyan you use up to three will reduce the amount of key that you regenerate it makes it harder for you to charge that energy but you get to keep that form super saiyan blue kind of splits the difference between the two with blue your key steadily drains but it will also drain from doing attacks yeah. so you just need to make sure you don't power down it was really cool and having all the transformations for the other races too like golden and the power pool and giant it was all really cool that was that was amazing oh it was such a good add-on like I mean, Super Saiyan or no, Saiyans in general, I think, are still a little overrepresented in that game in terms of transformations. But it's neat that the ones that shouldn't be restricted aren't. Like the fact that any race can use Kaioken or the Elder Kai's unlock ability or hidden potential. It, it's neat that they didn't restrict all of them to it. But having Golden Form and Power Pull, like seeing all those, that was just so cool. Yeah. Uh. And a lot of people complained early on about the Majin's transformation. I don't. I think that it's kind of fitting. Like people see a lot of people were saying when Xenoverse two, when that form was first announced, that it was lazy. Like what they just turn into kid boo. That's kind of lazy in terms of setting up the character, but it kind of makes sense. Like if kid boo was Majin Buu's purest form, then really all you have to think about it as is your Majin character has absorbed enough people to look like whatever your character is. And they shed all of that and turn into their pure form for their transformation. Like, it's silly that it looks like Kid Boo, sure, but beyond that, it honestly kind of makes sense from a lore standpoint. Yeah. All you're really doing is spitting everyone out and going back to your pure form. <laughs> they even call the transformation purification. Yeah, that's right. So don't be so silly, everyone. If you start playing the Majins, because it's pretty cool, and I think you're not taking that into, a, into account. Maybe. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoever's listening to this and taking that personally, I apologize. Well, guys, but I think that's pretty much all the time we have for now. Yeah, we definitely have a lot more on this subject to talk about, so I think we're going to have to do some more video game episodes because like, we're, we're pushing an hour on this one, and I, I don't feel like we even scratched the surface, to be honest. Very yeah. satisfied with what we talked about, but we ha I have so much more. Yeah, it was really fun, and it really, I, really, I think it was a good first episode. Absolutely. I hope other people thought it was a good first episode, too. If you thought it was, then maybe, you know, leave us a like and comment on how you thought we did good or what else you want us to talk about. And make sure to check out Smug Stick's channel uh, and make sure to check out mine. There will be links in the description. Yep. Thank you for listening, guys. Thanks a lot. We'll see you or you'll hear us next time on the Dragon Ball Access podcast. Bye. Bye.